Welcoming artists to the Hall of Fame is Julius Irving from the class of 1993. Ladies and gentlemen, Artis Gilmore. My name is Artis Gilmore, and I am a member of the Basketball Hall of Fame. And they go into Gilmore. You've got to deny him that ball if you can, because look what he can do. I don't know if a Hollywood scriptwriter could have done a better job watching the ascension of artists from Jacksonville. I would like to thank all my friends from JU. In fact, we were Showtime before there was Showtime. We played wide open basketball. We loved to run. No, no shot clock, no three point shot, and no dunking. We still averaged 100 points a game. Gilmore will jump against Sidney Wicks. The Cinderella team, the unknowns, against the defending national champs UCLA. And the tip is over to Jacksonville. Morgan breaks and hits the open goal. What were y'all's impressions when we started our, our senior year, when my senior year, which had been 69, 70? I remember the first time Coach walked in with Artis, and he walked in next to Joe. Joe's tall, but I mean, Artis was just like imposing. And I remember Rex saying to this day, he said, we can win it all with these guys. I remember uh, that too. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, and I remember thinking that uh, it was going to be a, a, a pretty good year. The biggest barrier we had to overcome was probably by being an unknown, being such a small school. I think that probably a lot of people here didn't even know about Jacksonville University. The student population of 2,300 kids was the smallest school ever to make it to the Final Four. Nothing has affected this city like that run that they had and then going to the championship game. The national championship match Jacksonville against defending titleist UCLA. It was a crazy time. Free love, psychedelic, drugs. There were always challenges during that time. People protest, people fought for the right to really live the American dream. Vietnam War, you know, people were taking sides for it against the Kent State incident happened. Martin Luther King's assassination affected the African American community in general. Jacksonville is a southern town. We had a lot of the issues that many of the southern cities had. Not as bloody as some, but still, it was a dark spot, I think, in our history, like most southern towns have. It was somewhat of a divided city. Everyone in our communities, black and white, knew where the predominantly black neighborhoods were, and they knew where the predominantly white neighborhoods were. And so rock throwing and egg throwing was fairly frequent, averaging about twice a month. We had a day here in Jacksonville, which many refer to as Axe Handle Saturday. A lot of the white people brought axe handles down and they told the blacks not to come down. If they did, they'd get hit. I got caught up in the fray on that day because it just happened to be a Saturday. I was working at Morrison Cafeteria and I was the last one to leave. And when I walked across the street to leave, I was surrounded by all of these white men who had axe handles. And they uh, was hitting and prodding me. And I saw a police officer about 10 or 15 feet away. And he told me, you better get out of here before they kill you. We 
certainly come a long way from the 60s to where we are today. Jacksonville University was ahead of the city. Well, having visionary leaders like Fran Kenny made a difference, and that's what makes a difference in the city. There's no question about the fact that in the environs of the campus at JU, we felt much safer and much more welcome. Chip Dubon came in as the first black athlete at JU. Chipper was the perfect guy to integrate. Well, he got along with everybody. He was one of the most popular players in town. He'd go up in a room with nothing but Central Club members and predominantly white and shake their hands and smile and be very nice and he's outgoing, very pleasant. Chipper was the fifth man. Always could count on him to come in. Great ball handler. And so when the team was down, he always provided the spark in his defense, in his scoring, but most importantly, in his encouragement. Rex was the first really great basketball player that we had, and we learned he was a different kind of player. We had told Rex, you come here, we're going to get you the ball. Well, the first time in practice we got him the ball, he drove in and laid it up, and we said, he didn't run our offense. And Tom and I got together and wisely said, well, that's why we got him here. Maybe we need to change our offense. Rex was a natural leader on the basketball court. He immediately took it on to kind of lead this team, and I think Rex had set goals that a lot of the rest of us couldn't even imagine. And he may have been the, the gel that held us all together because he had that vision of going to the NCAA. We were recruiting Ernie Fleming from Gardner-Webb Junior College. Ernie wrote us a letter saying, that if you're still interested, I would like to come down there and play with you. And then he said, P.S., I'd like to bring my roommate, Artis Gilmore, with me. And once Tom and those guys received the letter, they thought about it for a second, said, well, let's go up and visit. And especially, you said a guy, I got a, a friend of mine that's seven foot tall. Let's go take a look. The artist was, uh, of course, a phenomenon, because not only was he seven foot two, but he had a 29-inch you know, thigh and a 32-inch waist, and he could jump out of the gym. So with, with his long span and his long arms and his big hands, I mean, he was just, you know, something to behold. Hardly anybody even knew that artists existed, which, which is amazing in itself that a, a player of his magnitude and size, that no, no one would know anything about him. So we kind of tried to keep it quiet so nobody would know that artists was committed. During that process, we were talking about my departure from Gardner Webb, and there was so much concern uh, whether, uh, and, and Ernie and I, we really fear and we very uncomfortable about the process. I had heard the story that they were smuggled out of Boiling Springs onto to Jacksonville. Maybe it was paranoid, maybe it was true, maybe it was not. We decided we were not going to catch an airplane, and we were not going to depart from an airplane. We were not going to catch a bus, because we just assumed that there would be personnel in those locations observing our departure. So we had a, a friend of ours to give us a ride <laughs> out on the outskirts, and that's where we met Joe and, and Tom in a vehicle. They picked us up. Artists were so unselfish. All the players loved him. Hubie Brown, who coached him in the pros later on and, and is a famous sportscaster, has often said that Artis was a gentle giant. He was maybe the strongest player that's ever played. Artis made players better by his presence on the floor. He shored up what defensive liabilities we had, and he rebounded. So if you can guard, you got somebody to basket, and you can rebound, then the rest of it is easy. And that's what he gave us. People come to me and say, you played with Artis Gilmore, and I correct them, Artis Gilmore played with me. At that time, there was only one black player in all of the SEC and J.U. was starting three. You know, and then, the, let me ask you a question, because I've been asked this before, <clears throat> that, you know, this is 69, 70. We'd had the assassinations. We had Martin Luther King. There was a lot of civil unrest. So what was going on on your basketball team? Because you felt a division between the blacks and the whites with the oh. prejudicial issues going on. And I said, you know, I met Chip here. I was the captain of the team when he came in. 
was our first black athlete, I mean, the coaches were concerned about how he's going to be treated. And I was raised in the South as a Jacksonville boy, and, you know, our families had the predisposed prejudice, but it was never personal. It was a different mentality in, in Jacksonville, and there was, I mean, a sense of tension in, in, in the community, but except for within our group of individuals. We had our first team dinner. Well, everybody ordered the drink, and Chip was right next to, to Wayne. Say so Chip had the milk, and Wayne Kruger had the Coke. And when they brought him, they reversed him. Wayne didn't notice it, so Chip drank some of Wayne's Coke. So Kruger looks over, he goes, where's my drink? He said, well, what'd you order? He said, well, I had a Coke. So Chip goes, oh, well, I got your drink. And he handed it to Wayne. So you could see everybody stopped to see if Wayne was going to drink after the black guy. Of course, Kruger, who was a perfect guy, because here's Mr. Cool, he's got a drink, right? So he uh, he drank the drink, and everybody went right on about the business. Nothing that was ever said about it. There was a famous restaurant in town, the chicken place, where we all went. And so we went in there as a team to eat, and they said, well, you all can eat here, but he's got to eat back in the kitchen. Well, that's OK. We'll all go in the kitchen and eat with him, man. That's fine. We don't mind at all. We're happy to go in the kitchen. And they were so they didn't know what to do. So they let Chipper eat with us out there. Once I was able to meet Joe and talk to him, he was just a straightforward person. And then for the first time, I did not see black and white. I mean, for the first time, it made me comfortable as a person and sort of helped my ability to perform on the basketball goals from, from here, like, to the sky, to the moon, in just a short period of time. The two coaches made all the difference in the world in the success of the team that year. Joe made you work. Joe believed in a good work ethic. All right, now let's get on the board. Let's get on the His coaching style is unique. Uh, everybody knew their job, and, and he just let you play. I've been coached, luckily, by three Hall of Famers, Errol Parsage and Tommy Heinsohn and Red Arback. But I learned more about basketball and life from Joe Williams and Tom Lawson than I did anybody. Joe would schedule them like they were a rock band. Rex told stories about Coach Williams' famous recruiting technique of explaining to, to kids, you can come to JU, and we're going to go to Hawaii, we're going to go to the Virgin Islands, we're going to play in New York City every year, or you can go to your SEC school that you're looking at, and you get to go to Starkville and Athens and Gainesville. We went with the tallest team in the beginning. We would start with Artis and Pembroke, and McIntyre or Blevins, and then we would have Rex at the two position and Vaughn. So we would be the tallest team in the country. And that's what people had to s prepare for. All right. All right, look, we want to get you the ball, but you play away from Rex for a little bit. All right? And then that'll mean that Pembroke, Pembroke, we're going to let you flash up in the high post. You're playing on Rex's side. Okay. All right? Now, Chipper, then you'll be looking to get the ball to Art some in there. Look inside to Art. Or Pam to feed the ball, penetrate with the ball, or get it back out to Weddick and see there's no pressure at all. But on defense, let's play some defense and we don't have, we're not getting any board. Okay. All right. What I remember the most to seeing the team come together and knowing we really were something is when we went up preseason and scrimmaged oh, against yeah. Duke. Yeah. We yeah, we played them and it just came together and we killed them. When the I mean, these guys were yeah. these guys were big name schools and we just destroyed them. You did the same thing to Davidson when we played him here yeah. in the gym. Yeah. Yeah. I, it just was. I, I said, we're mm -hmm. you know this is a good team. Yeah, we're we're gonna gonna do okay. But after the the Davidson scrimmage, I looked for a bookie, and my hangout at the beach was the Four Winds Lounge. The beach's bookie was a guy named Jocko, and I asked him about odds on undefeated season and they said it's, uh, the odds were actually a lot higher but as high as they would go was a hundred to one so i bet a hundred on both ends and uh i got a lot of advice to cut way back on the scotch and take a couple weeks off and i'd probably be okay they were 10 years ahead of their time they were the first to average 100 points a game they were the first to have twin towers and artists in pembroke and they were the first team to warm up to music one of my favorite parts of the games was the warm-ups when we played Sweet Georgia Brown. Yeah. 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 Chipper, yeah. Chipper Dublin would stand in the keyhole yeah. Yeah. and do his yeah. 
Globetrotters thing and we'd have two lines breaking. We'd have more people out watching us practice than uh, warm-up. Warm warm did Chipper start that? Yeah, yeah. Chipper yeah, started that. Yeah, I think Chipper, that was yeah. Chipper's deal. Chip, I want to ask you a little about this warm-up drill. You're in charge of the music. How did you get started with it? Well, one day at practice, we decided to do a little change of pace. So I brought my tape recorder over, and we just started playing it. Everybody got real psyched up about it. So we tried to you know, put that in every warm-ups we can, you know? And it really worked out pretty good. It gets us real loose and we're ready to go. We did a lot of dunking in our pre-game warm-ups. And you could dunk before the officials got there, I think. And we'd go out, and the officials wouldn't come to just for the game. And we could dunk, 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 and people loved it. We would warm up the sweet Georgia Brown and twirl the ball, and somebody would break, and he'd pass the ball here or there, shoot layups. And they had a good time, because warm-ups really have nothing to do with the way you play. I understand that some of the boys even start dancing around in the dressing room. Yeah, that's what the music gets so good to them, they've got to dance. So that's what we do, take this spirit out onto the court. There was a TV program that had, was airing that was called The Mod Squad, and somehow it picked up on us because we had longer hair. I had sort of the Elvis mutton shop look, and artists had started with the afros. The Booster Club, if I remember correctly, bought us some green double-breasted blazers, and I think it was gold pants with white stripes with bell bottoms. And I'm not sure which paper this was in, as in one of the articles, that a, a band of free-swinging renegades blew through here last night. I think the freedom to go ahead and express and the freedom to go ahead and try something a little bit different and allowing us to do it made us more responsible for owning what we did. Uh, as far as uh, going through warm-up routine and something like this, uh, I don't think uh, most teams use this. Uh, I know Adolph Rupp said he wouldn't let his players use music out on the court, but it, it just seems to be a new concept. Well, I just say it goes along with progress. You try, a little, try something until if it don't work out, you, you abandon it, but you at least try different things. And it seemed to help us, so we're going to keep with it. The most exciting game to me was by far Georgetown. Showed them that we could fight. <laughs> 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 so I just don't know what happened there. Georgetown had this player named White, who was one of the leading scorers in the country. And we played him there. Sports Illustrated was covering the game. And they didn't know about us. OK. And they're in Swisher Gym. And it's 70 degrees in December. And the gym's been packed since 5 o'clock. There's no air conditioning. So it's hot as can be. And Arthur White was a, a sophomore or junior, averaging 22. He had two points at the time. And right at the end of the first half, he got so frustrated. And I'm gigging him and telling him little things to keep his mind off the game. And he just, he just turned around and slugged me twice. And uh, you know, down I went. The next thing I see is the referee coming running over and say, you're out of the game and you're out of the game. So I, every, don't hold me back. I'm fine. Everything's fine. So I get loose and I act like I'm going to go over and shake his hand. And I came from as far back as I could go and hit him as hard as I could. Hit him so hard he left the ground and spun around before he hit the, hit the floor. I am a lion. And then the players came out and they jumped on Rex and hit him. And it was a melee out on the floor. It was like two minutes, 15 seconds left in the uh, first half of that ball game when the incident uh, took place. And they, ne they never came back out after halftime, no, no. right? No, right. the game. So in retrospect, as a team, what do you think happened to the city? What impact I, happened I, to Jacksonville? Very, I, I was going to address that. I think the team set the example for the city. And I think because the city didn't have anything to come together as a city, because you did not have the Jaguars, you did not have anything. And I think because they saw how well we got along, we were winning, we represented the city, and I think it gave the city something to, uh, to, to hold on to and to be proud of. There was a project called the Blodging Homes, I believe it was, and we're just riding, I think, maybe coming back to the college. So we just pull over and stop. And we said, well, let's go play ball with the kids. And the next thing I know, 
the crowd begins to, to grow. And that thing is, is in, in, in a matter of minutes, the word has spread that JU basketball team is, you know, in the middle of the lodging home playing basketball. And the next thing I know, I hear the police coming. And there may be a couple of hundred people that have shown up in about a matter of 30 minutes. And I can remember the police officer walking through the crowd and, and him getting on the radio and saying, oh, don't worry about it. Uh, it's just JU's basketball team playing basketball out here in the park. We were demanding much larger crowds, many of them to seven, eight, nine thousand 9,000 people. I think because once we started winning the games, we moved over to the Coliseum. More people could buy tickets. More people could see us on television. Jacksonville University's basketball team became Jacksonville, Florida's team. And it was across racial bounds. I think that the players did a lot for not just JU, but for the city to see black men becoming famous in the city because you got to remember integration of schools here was in 1968. There was no integration at all. We never even saw a black player or a black team. All the teams that we played against in the city were all white. There were very few intermingling games. Most of the games were blacks playing blacks during that time period. We had never experienced the what Bill Russell later called shotgun houses along the poor part of, of Jacksonville, just north of downtown. And in our first year, we played a couple of practice games before the season, and we drove to them because of budgetary restraints. One was the University of Alabama, and I drove one of the vehicles, and Coach Williams sent me ahead to find places that we could stop to have lunch because Chipper was with us. I had never imagined such a thing, couldn't imagine such a thing. That was the whole trip, that was what we did. And we had to find places it was okay to stay. And so that was very eye-opening for Rex and I, very um, shocking. Artists would get the most vile, racist hate mail, and it hurt him, but he didn't let it affect his play. When I saw Artis Gilmore, Pembroke Burroughs, Chip Dubling on the basketball team, that was, in effect, a chipping away at this society of segregation here in Jacksonville. And I think that the combination of that opened the eyes of lots of people to the possibilities of coexistence not only peacefully but for everybody's benefit. If you talk to people of that era, it jump-started the healing of race relations in this city and in this part of the region. And they came together over one thing, their love of the game and their love of these young men. One of my early memories was when we went up for that Christmas tournament in Evansville, Indiana. I'd never seen snow before and we had a lot of confidence in ourselves. But when we smoked those teams in that tournament, I thought, wow. Yeah. And one of them was Arizona, who was rated really high that year, right. and we killed them. Do you remember, we went into Tully Gym, and we were warming up at one end, and their cheerleaders came out with those bow constrictors around their neck, mm -hmm. you remember? And I remember Chipper going, I don't do snakes. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked over his shoulder that whole game. <laughs> that could be one of the factors. The game against Florida State and Tallahassee was a nightmare from the beginning. They brought a fish out in the middle of the floor before the game started, and they're hacking it in half and you know, doing everything they can to upset us. And I had never seen a pregame show like that before. And I'm like, man, that's intimidating there. Some of my greatest memories are going to play in Tully Gym against Dave Cowens and his team over there. They beat us 89 to 83. In my opinion, I think it was the best thing that could have happened to us early on. They showed us that we could be beat and not to take anything for granted. And we were all disappointed, but knew that we had lost to a very good Florida State team. 
The question then became, how would we deal with Florida State when they came to Jacksonville? The most significant game, I think, was probably the second Florida State game. Mm -hmm. Beating them right. gave us a confidence and kept us at one loss. Otherwise, we'd have had two losses. But significance-wise, I think uh, that second Florida State game was our best, most important anyway. And it lit the city up. The day the Coliseum stood still, I mean, they, they packed them in like sardines. I'd never seen that many people because they actually allowed, allowed the people to sit right up to the baseline. We weren't going to get beat on our home turf. I can remember that. And I mean, it was intense. And I think everybody was really up for that game and was prepared. Well, we broke the game open somewhere in the, in the second half, and we just had a good game. I think we beat them about the same amount that they beat us up there. Of course, Chip made this really backward twisting layup that, that everybody went nuts over, and that was a great play. And I think that was a turning point of that particular game. That game was just so exciting. People today, even today, that were around that went to that game while talking about that Florida State and you know, JU game in the Coliseum. It was one of the most exciting athletic events they'd ever been to. That is when I think I realized uh, that we had something good. We were a fighting team. We were a together team. And, and we could play together, and we could beat other teams. We would start beating everybody again. And uh, until we got the call that said we're going to the NCAA, I, I really didn't think we were that good. I know as it approached for the bid that the coaches were extremely concerned about it. Because in those days, only 24 teams went to the NCAA playoffs. You had to win your conference, and there were just a few independents that got to go. But one of the elements, too, in my opinion, is that we were a deep team. And, you know, artists would get in trouble. Them would get in trouble. Rex would get in trouble. Bond, and we, we had players. Yeah. They would get in trouble and had to go out of the game. And I don't know when artists would have to go out there, but you know, the fans would shrink. They'd go, oh my gosh, this is, the, the, it's over. And yet somebody would step right up. Certainly, you know, after I was in foul trouble on a number of different occasions, especially Pembroke stepping up in, in the Iowa game. Oh, that, that was, was, that that was, was one of the greatest games. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Iowa. The Iowa game, our first game in the Mideast Regionals uh, was against a very, very outstanding Iowa team. Iowa was 14-0 in the Big Ten that year. You had some great players on that Iowa team, and we just back and forth and back and forth with them the whole game. I got in foul trouble so quickly, but this, this team, they were just extraordinarily talented. We were down one. It's maybe less than 20 seconds to play. We got the ball, we went down the court. And I was looking at the clock and I was yelling at Vaughn to shoot the ball. That's all I remember yelling, shoot it, shoot it. And it was a hold your breath ending with a shot that went up. And it bounced. I thought the game was over and I saw this hand out of nowhere just come up and into the basket. It was 102 to 103 before the shot. It went in, we beat them 104 to 103. The buzzer went off before the ball hit the ground. I was telling everybody that it's unfortunate I didn't get to thank Vaughn for missing that shot for me, uh, to make me famous. But, uh, what, just think about Kentucky. Well, I've gone to uh, participate in an event up in Kentucky for many, many years, and certainly they're just like all yellow people, they do not forget. And so they, could, they continue to emphasize that one particular game that we beat the University of Kentucky, and I, I think they was Ranked number one. Let me ask you, remember the charge on uh, Vaughn took on Dan Issel? Yeah, yeah. that was it. I mean, I'm standing there watching. He took a hit, Vaughn did, but Issel fouled out. And, and I remember Coach, I mean, this guy was just um, eight off right. Yeah. Spitting, living, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. We had to go through both Iowa and Kentucky, and they were established pedigree programs. I think it was the mod squad against the establishment. 
is how they had it booked in the paper. And of course, when we went up there, they had a big sign, Jacksonville who? And our players saw that. The Kentucky game was a big deal. They were ranked number one in the country at the time. And they had Dan Essel and, and of course, Adolph Rupp was a legend in the Southeast, maybe in the nation. We had heard all the great things about Adolph Rupp and, of course, all the negative things as well that he did. had no desire to have any black athletes on his program. And I think that's the first time that someone really maybe indirectly confronted our team for having black athletes. I think we took that personally and really wanted, not only wanted to beat them because they were the number one team in the country at the time, but because how much we thought they looked down on us as a program and as a, as a team. We didn't know how deep they were as a team and we didn't know how good they were as, as a team. The Kentucky game was a lot of fun. I can still remember one of the first plays. Kentucky's got the ball, they come down the floor, they throw the ball into Issel. Issel goes to make his patented hook shot, and Artis jumped up and knocked it out of the air. And I looked at Issel, and he was there with his mouth open, like, how can, if, if I can't shoot a hook shot, what can I shoot? Artis was the best defensive player that I played against while I was at the University of Kentucky. And we were playing along, and a guy stepped in front of Artis, and Artis turned around and ran over him. That's the artist's third or fourth foul. So we said, we said to Vaughn, Vaughn, let's foul this out of the game. He had four fouls. And I have asked myself thousands of times why I was still on the floor with 10 minutes and 32 seconds to go with four fouls. So he's running down the floor, and he just stopped right in front of Dan Essel. And all of a sudden, Dan just plowed right over Von Wettick and, and picked up his fifth foul. Everybody went crazy. And Von was so excited that when he did it, he ran by the Kentucky bench and he yelled something at rough like, that's for you, old man. I think it was a foul. I ran right over the top of him. And there's no doubt in my mind that Vaughn did it intentionally. And it was a smart play. And we won. 100 to 106 in that ball game. Looking back, to me, that was the best game we ever played as a team. You know, I tell people, I tell it was a St. Bonaventure's game, Hardis, because we were always keyed up to play the very best teams at the very best level. Yeah, and Bob Lanier went out. There wasn't the same sense of competitiveness, like we got to win this game. It just like, we almost anticipated the win and I think that slowed our momentum down. Jacksonville and St. Bonaventure, the two combatants in the Eastern Championship, were newcomers to the final round of four. St. Bonaventure that year was pretty good. We were keyed up, and then we heard that Bob Lanier, who was their big guy, had gotten hurt and was not going to be able to play. Uh, I find it a shame that my son, uh, uh, Bob Lanier, is not here tonight, uh, because I know it will be an altogether different game. And I think that hurt us because when you don't think you're gonna be played against the best, maybe you don't think you've gotta play your best. At the outset, the Bonnie's Matt Gant, number 35, took the play away from the taller Dolphins. Normally a corner man, Gant was moved into the middle to replace Lanier. At 6'5", he surrendered seven inches to Jacksonville's Artis Gilmore. Nevertheless, Gant dominated play at both ends of the court. Scoring 10 points in six minutes, Gant inspired vision of an upset. They don't have a big man in there, and he's throwing on the board, he wants to fight. Look, 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 I want Bond to either get the good little soft jump shot in close, or else we're going to finish right, or you flash in the middle, get the ball and take it down inside and finish right. All right, we got to get the ball into Art if we can. We'll get a little bit more. And now, Art, when you come out to block the shot, take your man, you've also got to get back in the boat. Art, 
you got to do it for us, baby. We'll gradually get the ball to you more, but until we do, you got to take up the slack and get it on the, all the board. It was the guards who kept the Dolphins in the game. Rex Morgan and 5'10 playmaker Vaughn Wedeking carried the team. Gilmore closed in on Gant. If there was a pivotal play, this was it. A turnover, a fast break, a layup by Paul Hoffman, but a whistle on the play. The basket counted, but instead of trailing by just four points, the Bonnies fell back by six when Dublin hit one and one. Jacksonville had not played its best game, but for coach Joe Williams, this was unimportant because the Dolphins had won. Does the UCLA game haunt anybody like it does me? You know, I don't think we could have been more prepared, though. I mean, maybe individually uh, we could have done something more. I don't know that to be a fact, but God, we were in such good shape. The national championship matched Jacksonville against defending titleist UCLA. The fact of the matter is, when you look at a comparison of the two universities and the student population, it's almost a miracle. Nobody's won four championships in a row, but UCLA is going to do it today. Last year, nobody knew we had a so much left in basketball team, but this year with the NCAA, we're here to go all the way for the Dolphins. UCLA game was just magical to me. I'm looking around and I'm thinking, there are millions of people around the world looking at me right now. That's all, yeah, it just was so exciting. At number 40, at star, 62, a junior from Newport. Our game plan was they had five players and was to get them in foul trouble. Stepping in, Artis Gilmore will jump against Sidney Wick. The Cinderella team, the unknown, against the defending national champ, UCLA. And the tip is over to Jacksonville. Morgan breaks and hits the opening basket. We had a lead early on. We was playing, you know, we we thinking UCLA. I mean, they've won all these great, these championships. For three seasons, UCLA had ridden the three tall frame of Lou Alcindor to the national crown. Now, the situation was different. It was Jacksonville's seven foot, two inch giant, Artis Gilmore, number 53, who was controlling the tempo of the game rebounding and scoring at a racehorse pace. Started out really good. Rex hit some good shots. We had a little momentum. We were the only team during the season that they didn't press. They, they did not press our team because Coach Wooden said that we had beaten all the pressers that year. The U clans were committing frequent, uncharacteristic turnovers. We took their confidence away from them early, which everybody thought we would be the one that intimidated on the quote unquote big stage, and we weren't. Everything was just clicking and going, and we were just beating them to death, and we were just pulling away. And I can still remember, though, running down the floor and running past UCLA's bench and seeing Coach Wooden. He kind of had the look of, ah, we'll get him back. We'll, we'll still win. He, did, he just exuded confidence. We had everything going for us, and then right towards the end of the second, end of the first half, it started shifting. I believe that Coach Wooden started making adjustments. Oh, we have a little over seven minutes. A lot of time on our offense. Some good shots. Don't rush anything now. We don't want any force shots at all. But don't stand. That's right. Work to get open. Pass and cut hard. We'll get some easy baskets. It seemed like that every time we tried to make a run, the play, the fouls were called. The overzealous Dolphins were collecting numerous unnecessary personal fouls. We had to run a triple in for Rex. This is stop. We haven't shot one yet. We haven't got a foul. Got a foul. With seven minutes left in the half, Sidney Wicks commenced to wrest control of the backboard. This in turn triggered the Bruins' devastating fast break. They got transition buckets on us and closed out the half and went from down to being up at halftime. And quite frankly, they, at that point, momentum changed and they've got their confidence. Sidney felt that he could go behind Artis and be more effective than trying to fret Artis. Artis, when he got the ball down low, was impossible to stop. Wicks repeatedly blocked Gilmore's shots 
and the cat put you plans, a precision team, were alert to every opportunity. For the first time, artist is getting his shot blocked and he's intimidated. I think the officials had never seen anybody like artists playing. When you're seven two and you jump, you gotta be shooting down. And I can remember all of us on the bench commenting, man, that was that was goaltending. And you, you feel invincible that you're not gonna lose. And all of a sudden, the wheels started falling off. With Gilmore neutralized, the Dolphins' demise seemed inevitable. They were a really big team. Uh, but I don't think they were quite as quick and fast as we were with our forwards. Joe Williams called me and he said, called me on. I was on the bench at the time. He said, I want you to go in and I want you to guard Wicks. He said, and I don't want you to let him catch the ball. Look, don't let him. Whoever's playing, if his own artist is trying to rob, you know, don't let him make that easy pass. But you got to stay with him right out of the half court. Now, look, he must get back on defense. Now, don't let him get the break on it. Don't let him get the break, Vaughn. I'll back in the hall. And I, I remember, I, ne I never said it, but I thought I said, well, Coke, should I get you a hot dog and Coke while I'm out there? I mean, like, <laughs> mission impossible. Jacksonville coach Joe Williams proved a prophet of doom. The thing he feared most, the UCLA fast break, was death to the Dolphins. The magic was gone. They came back. And we just never got back on track. Gilmore and Burroughs who combined for 22 points in the first half, were held to seven in the second. Gilmore suffered the ultimate indignity when he fouled out. It was a devastating game, emotionally. It's something you don't ever get out of your mind, because how many people get that close? My take on the UCLA game is they were a great basketball team, coached by probably one of the greatest coaches ever. We played a good game, and we got beat. I think they played better than we did. They played a great game. They were a great team. And they deserved to win that game. The Scrappy Dolphins fought to the finish, but they were not a match for the more experienced, better balanced Bruins. Think about years later, Von Wettick and myself and a couple other colleagues we were able to sit down and have a dinner at one of John Wooden's form of a player's house. And one of the first thing, before any kind of a conversation or anything started, John Valley said, absolutely, we looked at the, the tapes, we realized it was goaltending. And then we, suddenly we turned and looked at Coach Wooden and there was no comment, nothing whatsoever, just a smile. We've lost the finals, we're coming back home, and, and we had the same amount of support that we had when we won. We come off the plane, and I, there's thousands of people at the airport, and we had never seen that before, and I'm like, I cannot believe all these people drove all the way to the airport to welcome us back, and I was amazed at the thousands of people that came. When we stepped out on the uh, balcony, uh, the second floor of the Jackson International, and all those fans were out there, and we were waving and that. I mean, it was, it was something. We had police escort from the airport back to the campus, and all along the highway, there were just waves of people. It was almost as if we had won the championship. I would say that that team, that year, is so historic, how it brought everybody together, not just JU, not just Jacksonville. It brought everybody in Florida. And as a matter of fact, I had never seen this before. And I thought, what a wonderful way to live. I think it's rare that we have the ability and the time to celebrate cultural shifts when everyone's still generally with us to do it. I think it's important that we spend a minute and celebrate what these coaches created, what President Kinney created, what artist Gilmore and his teammates created, because what they did is have an impact on a city and a region and the life of an institution that has already lasted decades, and I hope it lasts decades more. It was a time 
in Jacksonville history that I feel like the community came together. It's those type incidents, cumulatively, that have made the Jacksonville community what it is today. Having elected an African-American sheriff, having elected an African-American mayor, that's a big deal. They paved the way for people like me to move up not only at Jacksonville University, but also in this city that they changed the course of history, not only putting Jacksonville University on the map, but, but the city of Jacksonville on the map, that they made a difference and is still making a difference in our city today. Sir, I just saw you at Kirby. How are you doing, sir? Nice to see you. I nice saw you at Vargas. Yes, sir. You know, we all are bonded for life um, because of what we had done and accomplished that nobody think could be done from such a small school as, as Jacksonville. And I think also because something you mentioned that uh, I think it was an element of surprise that got us past a lot of teams mm -hmm. because they underestimated Hello, guys. I hope you're all oh. 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 Yeah. Oh. Good to see you all. Perfect timing. Coach. Hey, Coach, come on up here. Yeah, totally. <laughs> hey guys, if I look like I, if I look like I'm limping, it's because Nelson, I haven't gotten over trying to teach him how to draw a chart. <laughs> it was a great, great year, man. I'm gonna tell you, I think for all of us, that was a wonderful year. Oh yeah. And everybody contributed, you know. Let me tell a Joe Williams story. And I'm we've all sure had a lot of them. He's heard some of them, but you know, Joe had this idea of when he blows the whistle, you got to sprint to where he's standing. We are out there practicing three or four days, and he blew the whistle, and everybody hustled up, and artists come, mm -mm -mm. and so Joe didn't say anything. But for the next year, every time Joe blew the whistle, he was standing right next to artists. <laughs> And I said, uh, I said, that was pretty good, guys, but did you see how fast I was? <laughs> I had a lot better time when you guys got here than I did before you came. Oh, right, here. there's no doubt about that. We, we suddenly became uh, good coaches. Some of those plays worked. <laughs> I, think, I think the real key was that everybody wanted to have somebody on their team that could sing about having a rooster. Oh, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> they said, we need a guy that can sing like Pembroke Burroughs. Why don't yeah. you lead that? Why don't you lead us in a little what? chorus of that? 45, how many years? <laughs> you couldn't sing 45. then, buddy. <laughs> You know the mod squad. He's going. He's, he's going. So they don't want that. Yeah, yeah. let's let's hear. Yeah. Let's hear. Yeah. <laughs> Jacksonville had a rooster. Jacksonville had a rooster, and they put him on the fence. And they put him on the fence. And he crowed for the dolphins. And he crowed for the dolphins. Cause he had good sense. Cause he had good sense. Hadi 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 ho. Hadi 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 ho. Oh 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 oh. If I could time travel and go back to 1970 and talk to the team, uh, on the heavy side, I would tell them how much I cared about them, how much they'd meant to me. On the lighter side, I would tell them to tell the referees before the game to watch for goaltending. Um, there isn't much I would change. It was, it was a great, great ride with um, very good friends. What would I say to my teammates? If I could say one thing to them, it would be thank you. It was just a great experience. And it's something that is carried over. And, uh, Sorry. Uh, you know, yeah, it was just, uh, again, I felt very fortunate to be part of it all. And uh, I was accepted into, you know, a team with good athletes and good basketball smarts, which I didn't have much of maybe at the time. And, uh, but yeah, just to this day, I'm just very thankful. Because of this team, the question of Jacksonville who was answered once and for all. This legend would have it, the story survives. 
The timing was perfect, the stars were aligned. Destiny motion for lightning to strike on a Jacksonville gym in the autumn of 69. 1969. 